subject.
led by Dr. Rosel Balmores. I Know Why the Caged Bird Sings by Maya Angelou. The free bird leaps on the back of the wind and floats downstream till the current ends and dips his wings in the orange sun rays and dares to claim the sky. But the bird that stalks down his narrow cage can seldom see through his bars of rage. His wings are clipped, his feet are tied, so he opens his throat to sing. The cage bird sings with fearful thrill of the things unknown but longed for still. And his tune is heard on the distant hill for the cage bird sings of freedom. The free bird thinks of another breeze and the trade winds soft through the sighing trees. And the fat worms waiting on a dawn bright lawn and he names the sky his own. But the cage bird stands on the grave of dreams his shadow shouts on a nightmare scream. His wings are clipped and his feet are tied, so he opens his throat to sing. The cage bird sings with a fearful trill of things unknown but longed for still. And his tune is heard on the distant hill, for the cage bird sings of freedom. You may all see it. Thank you. Okay, it's the next part of the program to taste uh, to trace ba the connections of our speaker to our beloved city of Baguio. Uh, we have with us Professor Mita Dimalanta of the Institute of Management and the Pinecone Movement. Good afternoon. The Pinecone Movement's vision is Baguio a renewed and ever-renewing city in terms of matter and spirit whose concerned and committed citizens uphold life-giving and sustainable practices, spiritual, emotional, political, social, educational, and environmental. Our mission is to work towards a commitment in realizing this vision primarily through protecting and preserving the environment in gratitude to its past heritage and sustainable future by raising funds, accepting donations, cooperating with national and local government agencies and other activities that will promote it, conducting information drives, and organizing forums to discuss issues. Last year, the Pine Cone Movement Chairperson Maribel Ongpin tasked us to invite Richard Haydarian for an environmental talk on Baguio. However, at that time, Richard was very busy. He was touring and promoting one of his books in Asia and the United States. The son of Asia, Persian-Filipino Richard Foronda Haydarian, lived in Baguio but left after the devastating earthquake to return to the University of the Philippines for college. His love for Baguio is evident in his series of articles, Beautiful Baguio, What Happened? published by Rappler in May of 2015, My Lamentations as a Baguio Boy, The End of Baguio, published by the Manila Bulletin in July of 2017, and Baguio, My Dying Hometown, August 2018, among others. We invited Richard again this year, and we were able to do so thanks to the help of his aunt, Didi Feronda, please stand, <laughs> to thank, we'll thank you, our neighbor and another aunt, our family dentist and champion golfer, Dr. Maki Foranda Abriol. But Richard had other plans. He preferred to discuss a political topic instead of an environmental one. Thus, the Pinecone Movement and the Baggy We Want Forum, headed by our very own uh, UP Baguio Chancellor, uh, Ray Rovilios, who's here, requested the Department of Economics and Political Science of the College of Social Sciences of UP Baguio, chaired by Dr. Aquiles Archie Costales, to host Richard's lecture on how to make democracy work toward inclusive development. We thank Dr. Aquiles Costales for hosting this lecture. We are grateful to Richard for his return to Baguio to share his wisdom with us. 
his first public talk in our beloved city of Pines. Ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Richard Faronda Haydarian. Thank you, ma'am. To formally introduce our guest speaker, may I call on Dr. Aquiles Castales, Chair of the Department of Economics and Political Science. Good afternoon, our guest speaker, Richard Hedarian, the Chancellor, Raimundo Revilius, also my friend, uh, Jim Ward of the Daily Cycle Movement, the faculty of the University of the Philippines, Baguio. Uh, I think we also have guests from the University of the Cordilleras, I saw in the registration, and PMA, a Philippine, is that Philippine Military Academy? Richard Javad Hedarian is an academic, a columnist, and a policy advisor. He has taught as a political science assistant professor at the De La Salle University, Manila, and Ateneo de Manila University. Maybe Next time, he will teach here as a visiting professor. He is currently resident analyst of, at the GMA Network and a columnist for the Philippine Daily Inquirer. He is also a fellow at the Strat-based Alberto del Rosario Institute, Manila, and the ADRI as it is known, is an independent international and strategic research organization with the principal goal of addressing the issues affecting the Philippines and East Asia. He's a regular contributor to the Council on Foreign Relations and the Center for Strategic International Studies in Washington, D.C. He has written for or and interviewed by Al Jazeera, the BBC, Bloomberg, the CNN, the New York Times, the Washington Post, the Guardian, the Wall Street Journal, Foreign Affairs, Foreign Policy, The Economist, and among other global publications. <coughs> Professor Hiderian's latest book is The Rise of the Duterte, a populist revolt against elite democracy. And he's also the author of a forthcoming book, The Indo-Pacific Age, Trump, China, and the New Global Struggle for Mastery. Professor Hedarian was awarded as, the, as one of the 10 outstanding young persons in the world, in the world in the Ilang Pilipinas, no? by the Junior Chamber International, or JCI, for his contributions in social sciences. He has been described as one of Asia's most prolific analysts. In the grant of the award, he is described as follows, as a leading global expert on security issues across Asia. It has been said that Hedarian has few peers when it comes to bringing us to an understanding of the most geopolitical dynamic part of the world. Richard Javad Hedarian uses his writing skills to address the growing need for the public to understand the changing landscape of political thinking. Hedarian serves as a nonpartisan policy advisor and socially engaged scholar to explore the most pressing political and socioeconomic challenges of our time. Hadarian advances his mission to inspire a new generation of leaders who push boundaries to create positive and lasting change for a better Philippines and for a better world. He has been invited to speak at the world's leading universities such as Harvard University, 
Stanford University, Columbia, Columbia University, York University, Australian National University, among others, and major global conferences on Asian geopolitical affairs. Richard Edarian. Thank you very much. Salamat. Okay, uh, naimbag nga aldaw. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. Uh, uh, buenos dias. <laughs> um, it's, a, it's, it's great that finally we made this happen. Uh, I'm sorry, last year we were not able to make this happen. This year, actually, I was supposed to give a talk in November, and then we had to move it again. So thank you very much for your patience. And then I thought that maybe December would be great because my mom will be also around, uh, my ultimate uh, stage mother. <laughs> I used to get always bullied back in school <laughs> for her. Uh, and here I am, a 31-year-old man, and uh, sa same, same, <laughs> in terms of dynamics here. So I thought it would be great if we do it in December. Um, I hate to give excuses and caveats, I'll really do my best, but let me warn you that this is going to be a very convoluted, probably long and boring presentation, but I'll try to make the most out of it. This is an academic setting, so I'll give you some RRL and bibliography, and probably this will be a preview of uh, a book in the future, hopefully, once I have time, once I'm over with Duterte and Trump and all of these people, um, uh, <laughs> once the fat is gone. Um, and uh, my God, like um, I don't know which time zone my brain is right now. I've been in four different countries in the past month, and I drove here this morning because Tita Didi's eyes was not seeing well, so I had to drive all the way up. So I'm still in the adrenaline rush. So if I kind of plateau later on during question and answer, please forgive me. The good news, though, is I've written 1,000 articles probably already. Uh, so a lot of things I'm going to say here have, are already you know, available online. Uh, in addition to boring journal articles I've written that probably no one uh, has read yet. Uh, but, so, don't worry. Like, if, <laughs> if my kapos, pwede kayo humabol uh, somewhere else. Now, it's really a pleasure to be back here in uh, UP. Um, uh, of course, uh, I know some of us are still sad about what happened yesterday. Sabi ko sa mga Ateneo, where I used to teach. I mean, for me, I didn't used to have any, kumbaga, wala akong, ano dyan, uh, paborito dyan in the sense that, you know, I've taught in La Salle, I've taught in Ateneo, I'm from UP. Uh, all of these schools are dear to me, but of course, it was shocking that UP finally made it to the finals, right? And... <laughs> And like 1986, right? So, so you know, we always tell our Ateneo friends, sacrifice naman para sa bayan, so that we have another 1986. But it seems they had other ideas yesterday. And of course, there were some political jokes that, yeah, the reason why 1986 probably didn't turn out very well, look at where we are today, is because, uh, am I in a dangerous territory? Is because UP won. So hopefully with Ateneo winning better, things will happen uh, this year. Pero hindi tayo pinagbigyan, no? Anyways, um... So, today I'm going to talk about uh, making our democracy work. Actually, I got the title from uh, Robert Putnam, uh, a great uh, American sociologist, uh, where he actually tried to analyze why Italy is such a diverse country, right? Um, I, I'm so, I suppose you're familiar with Italy, right? But the Italy we know is more like the southern mafia, mafioso Italy, right? But if you're familiar with Italy, it's actually a very diverse country, right? North of Italy is very your... Ferrari, you know, your, your fashion, that's where things come from, right? Uh, that's the uh, very productive part of Italy. South, very south, that's where the mafias come from, you know, the Al Pacinos and the, all those movies. And center is where the manufacturing and labor unions come from. So it's a very diverse country. And his book, uh, How Democracy Works, he analyzes why uh, Italy is such a diverse country, also in terms of its institutional strength in terms of its levels of economic development. So if you go from northern Italy to southern Italy, it's like you went from fourth world to first world, right? <laughs> Within a day or so. It's such a diverse level of development in that country. And of course, you know, Italy is also a special country to me because I remember when, when you start studying about sociology and all, they always tell you, tayo mga asyano, we are family oriented, we are emotional, while Western people are rational, individualistic. And I said, have you met Italians, right? They're just like us Filipinos, right? In fact, I was telling these jokes to some friends in Europe and they told me to watch a video on YouTube. Probably it's still there. They said the, the video is called 
Italy versus Europe, right? Uh, so my point is, uh, there are a lot of studies done about why democracies work and not work, and there are a lot of factors that contribute to that. And I think that's very relevant to us today because the zeitgeist or the spirit of the times we are in today is discontent, right, about the state of our democracy. And in many ways, I believe the problem with democracy is, is that it overpromises. And democracy is not a solution to all problems. It's not the answers to all questions. And I believe one of the problems we have here in the Philippines is that we misunderstand what democracy is supposed to deliver and what democracy is and is not. Because if you misdiagnose the problem and the question, you will definitely give a wrong answer. And of course, you can know what's the implication of what I'm saying. The implication of what I'm saying is that, unfortunately, since we are now focused on the wrong answers. So let's talk about environmentalism. Um, but in a way, actually, the presentation today will also pr pr probably actually help us to deal also with the predicaments we face here in our beloved Baguio, right? Baguio for me is a very special place, um, not because only I was born here, and hopefully one day, you know, uh, once I pass, I, I, I'm fine to be buried in this place. Um, the thing is, Baguio is a special place because it has a very different historical legacy, right? We are kind of like Northern Italy, right? <laughs> um, if you look at Baguio, we're, we're a modern city, right? Uh, unlike big cities who were built during the Spanish era or pre-Spanish era. It's a very middle class city. So when I moved to Manila, I was really shocked by the levels of, you know, inequality and the levels of cliquishness of the rich kids, you know, from Forbes and Alabang and the rest. You know, I never felt that here in Baguio, you know, rich friends, poor friends, we all hang out together, we go play Counter-Strike together, we make jokes the same together, uh, we date, you know, in similar circles. So I was very proud to be from Baguio precisely because of that very different sociological, you know, background and, uh, and, and, uh, that we have. Uh, and my fear is, as time goes by, right, we are more looking like the rest of the Philippines, right, than the rest of the Philippines looking like us. Uh, no, no, nothing wrong with the rest of Philippines per se, I just felt we have to be an inspiration for the rest of the country um, because of the kind of culture of egalitarianism and the high emphasis on education that we also have in this country. Okay, that's a very long introduction, probably I don't need to give the presentation anymore. Now let's go to the boring part. Um, May we go to the next slide? So I'll very quickly go through them. So I'll just breeze through the PowerPoints. You can have the power, copy of PowerPoints yourself. You can cite it if you want for your academic words. The first thing I wanted to answer is this question. They always say, ah, ganito tayo sa Pilipinas kasi ganito yung Pinoy eh. Tamad ang Pinoy, hindi sumusunod sa disiplina. Kailangan natin ng disiplina. Huh? We hear that a lot. But, you know, for someone who has traveled around the world and has seen Filipinos succeed, right? has seen Filipinos succeed around the world because actually Filipinos are known to be law-abiding, extremely efficient people and disciplined, right? I felt it's a disservice to us to buy that kind of stereotype of ourselves, right? As supposed to be lazy people or not following discipline. I noticed that Filipinos behave in accordance to their environment. So if they're in a first world context where everyone follows rules, they follow rules. But where they, when they are in a fourth world context, they adjust accordingly, right? We're malleable, we're human beings, and human beings are dynamic, right? Um, and that's why I'll talk about Orientalism a little bit. I think that's an important thing. The second thing is this, what I call strongman syndrome, right? And this is not targeted against any specific individual. In fact, I have good relationship with a number of strongmen. Um, the thing though is, strongman syndrome is this simplistic belief that we're gonna face and confront and overcome very complex 21st century problems by just giving our faith and votes to one person. And that person with that political will will magically solve that complicated problems. I believe, again, that's a disservice to us as citizens because we know that the challenges we face are so complicated, you need teamwork, right? And you know, as the cliche speech of J.F. Kennedy goes, it's not about what your government can do for you, but what you can do for the government. So by putting our faith in one person, somehow we're absolving ourselves of our responsibilities as citizens to do our job. And our responsibilities as citizens doesn't stop with the ballot box. Ballot box. It actually continues after that because we have to hold our leaders accountable. The third thing I'll discuss, I love this one, is uh, um, form, I mean, ex- um, ex-dancer, ex-assistant secretary, future congresswoman, um, 
Mocha Uson, she calls it Pepe Dede Realismo, um, or uh, Federalism, as in P H E D R L I S M. Um, is that is this a question of just changing a form of our government, right? Because it's not a changing system; it's just a form of government. So we'll breeze through that. Through again, breeze. I don't have enough time. I want to have more interaction with you guys. And the last one is institutionalist approach, because I believe this is the correct way to analyze the issue, right? Um, and for me, the solution is in the state. We have to strengthen our state institutions. And I'll go to that later on. Now, that is relevant also because I'll also discuss social capital and civic culture. And if we want to, if we want to deal with the problem of degradation of the city, both ecologically and otherwise, we need to have a strong civic culture. And if we don't have that, we have to develop that, right? But at the same time, we have to engage state institutions, and we have to make sure that the state institutions do their job in terms of supervising and taming uh, capitalist practices that are degrading the city. OK, let's go next. OK, are you familiar with this guy? He's, he's not a Hollywood actor, just to be very clear. right? So probably some of you have heard about him, Max Weber. Right? Uh, he's arguably the, you know, the most famous sociologist of his time. Um, I kind of like Max Weber because Max Weber used to get a lot of flack in the, back in the time because Max Weber was kind of, sorry for being politically incorrect, but he was kind of ADHD, right? He would write on everything, practically on everything, right? And I get a lot of hate for also writing on practically everything, right? So each book of mine is on a different topic. So a lot of specialist academic friends are saying, this Richard, you know, he doesn't specialize. He writes on different things. And I always say, I specialize in things that are generally important, right? And I write academic books, right? You have an issue, write your academic book, right? Then let's see. OK, forget about that. Let's move on. Um, now, Max Weber, of course, is known for a lot of great things. But at the same time, I think one of his theories was a little bit problematic, right? And that goes to his book next. Uh, the Protestant Ethic and the Spirit of Capitalism. It's a very sophisticated way of saying only Protestant people are going to be economically successful. Because his argument is that there's something in the Protestant culture, right, that makes them very much conducive to the dynamics of entrepreneurship, right? What was his argument? His argument is that, of course, unlike Catholics, right, who say the real life is the next life, whatever, forget about now. The Protestants believe that success in this world is connected to the blessing of the Lord, right? And the Protestants also are very known for strong social bonds, right? Have you noticed Protestant church, born-again church, right? It's very community strong, uh, a very uh, thick uh, societies. Um, and for him, those were the elements that make Protestant countries very successful. So back in the early 20th century, he, he mentioned, he said, look at the most successful countries around the world. Who have the fastest economic growth? England, right, which was a Protestant majority country, United States, Protestant major majority country at this back then, and Germany, right? So, and he said, oh, look at the Catholic countries, right? They're all behind. And interestingly, he also wrote, wrote a book about Confucianism. He was a brilliant guy. He wrote about all religions. And his argument was Confucian countries will never progress because Confucianism emphasizes passivity and obedience, right? 100 years forward, which are the fastest growing economies on earth? China. In fact, the most successful capitalist experience in human history is China. They lifted 600 million people out of poverty in one and a half generation, right? And that's a f and they have r so ironically, a communist and a Confucian country has been the most successful capital experience in human history, right? Not to mention, uh, Max Weber didn't mention the Jews a lot, right? Because the Jewish people are also very successful in terms of entrepreneurship. I don't want to say things about Germans, but. <laughs> You get the idea, right? Not to mention, he also forgot about some Catholic countries who are very economically successful, like France and Belgium. And if today you go to Spain, right, you go to Portugal, these are also high-income countries. So I think he was missing something, right? And the problem today is Max Weber's idea of connection between culture and economic success, I think is being replicated in different forms. So let's go to the next one. Ah, I love this article. I suggest you read it. It's by James Fallows, who was the, um, who was the uh, speech writer of Jimmy Carter, and he still writes for The Atlantic. Really nice stuff. So he was in the Philippines after 1986 revolution, and he wanted to explain why the Philippines is so behind other Asian countries. And of course, he speaks as an American, and we were the only American colony, so you can sense a sense of embarrassment, right? 
E colony na natin ng Pilipinas, bakit para napag-iwanan sila habang ibang Asian countries, napaka-asensado. So he said, the problem in the Philippines is a damaged culture. Parang, it's like psychological. It's like your damaged personality or damaged history. And his, basically his argument was this. Ang Filipino ang have lack initiative, right? Easily given to corruption. And they're too dependent on the U.S. They're not self-reliant. Right? That was his argument. And remember, during that time, we were known as sick man of Asia in the 1980s, right? Because our economy collapsed in 1982, contrary to myths about the past. Um, and, um, and guess what? From 1986 to 1989, we went through different coup d'etats, seven, eight, nine, depending on how we count it. And our economy was in big trouble. It was actually then when Lee Kuan Yew visited Manila and said, oh, you don't need democracy, you need discipline and stuff like that. But we were dealing with a very difficult situation in the 1980s. No. Now, who is the fastest growing economy in Southeast Asia today? Philippines. We're the fastest growing economy in Southeast Asia, growing at 6.5 to 7%, right? And next year, the Philippines will have a per capita income of 4,100 to $200, which will make us an upper middle income country. We'll be in the upper half of ASEAN, right? No, Vietnam is not catching up with the Philippines in terms per capita, nor is Indonesia, right? We are finally putting ourselves together. We're no longer sick, man. We're just attention deficit. <laughs> that that in drama, but we're, we're moving forward, right? Um, so... This is my problem with this kind of snapshot cultural analysis. You look at the country today and make generalizations about that country, right? Which like, takes, takes me to the next slide. There are many problems with this culturalist argument. First of all is the Orientalist reductionism. So if you go to the works of Edward Said, I think one of the greatest works was Orientalism. It really woke me up. His idea is this. If you look at social sciences and media coverage, when they discuss Western societies, they discuss people who are torchbearers of history, meaning dynamic societies, right? So when they say human history is essentially European history, right? Uh, uh, you know, Roman period, and then Dark Ages, Vikings, and then medieval, and then Renaissance, and then modernity, right? And then postmodernity, whatever. Um, but when they discuss non-Western society, it tends to be very generic, right? It tends to be like, oh, Chinese people are like that, or like Asians are like that, or Arabs are like that. Uh, and it's actually very true. Have you noticed media coverage, for instance, of Arab people, right? They never show, like, I really suggest you guys check this guy, Maz Jobrani, right? He's a funny, funny guy. He said, did you notice in media, whenever they show a Middle Eastern country, it's about some angry mob saying death to America or something like that, right? They never show an ordinary guy saying, hello, my name is Mahmoud and I make a pancake, you know? Or hello, you know, my name is, uh, I don't know, uh, is, my name is J Javad and I got a flower for my wife today, you know? You don't see those things. You always see, you know, Arabs and Middle Eastern show in this kind of violent, mobbish way, right? That is why actually... Uh, you know, to my students, I suggested for them, I, I forced them to read books and book review. And I, Khalid Hosseini's books are actually fantastic. If you read the Khalid Hosseini's books, it talks about, you know, they're, they're diverse people, right? In fact, Arabs are very diverse people. You have the uh, beautiful deserts of Morocco, but you have lush and snowy mountains in Lebanon and Syria, right? It's, it's not the same. So his idea was, even in social sciences, those kind of generic, right? Essentialist views are there. Essentialist means this. Ikaw, Kumbaga, meron kang algorithm, ito ka na talaga. Ang Pinoy ay ganito. But Western societies, when you talk about their history, they, it's always about evolution and moving forward, right? So it seems we are static, the non-white people, or white people are supposed to be dynamic. This is the embedded bias in social sciences. And Edward Said traces, back, traces, that, traces that back to the fact that modern social sciences were found by empires, right? If you look at the academies, top academies in France or Britain, Royal Academies, they were actually funded or co-founded with the imperial projects of this country. They wanted to understand col colonized societies because by understanding their society, they felt it's easier for them to colonize them, right? And his argument is that over 200 years, those biases are still inherently there, right? Okay. The other problem is it's empirically questionable. As I showed you a while ago, Max Weber was flatly wrong. Confucianism is not against capitalism because Confucianism evolves too, my friend, right? In fact, one of the interesting things I came across is this. Dito sa Pilipinas, pag pinag-usapan yung Katolicismo, we always talk about a reactionary religion, right? The Spanish backward people came and blah, blah, blah. But you, did you know that actually in countries like South Korea, 
One reason why South Korea's Confucianism became more dynamic is because it mixed with friars, 19th, 20th century Catholicism, the more modern version of Catholicism that came in. And it was the mixture of uh, neo-Confucianism, which is the old Confucianism, and Catholicism that created a new dynamic society, a new dynamic elite, actually. So what I'm telling you is that it's like chemistry, right? Culture is malleable, it can change, and culture is not isolated. Different religions mix, different culture mix, and then biglang may magandang kalabasan, and then may kakaibang kalabasan. But things move over time, right? So Catholicism did to the Philippines what it didn't do to Korea, because its mixture with our culture was different. And second, the kind of Catholicism that went to South Korea in the early 20th century, 19th century, was different from the Catholicism that went to us in 16th century by Magellan, right? So that's why you cannot make generic statements about Confucianism as A and Catholicism as B. Do you get my point? Again, this is very complicated. I can give you an RRL, but I'm just simplifying this, right? Um, the third one is rejects common sense. As I said, if culture is the explanation for economic development, right, why was the Philippines actually ahead of South Korea and China, right? Practically everyone except Japan in East Asia in 1950s up until early 1960s. You know the Asian Development Bank, right? Asian Development Bank is the big bank of Asia. San Yu headquarters near. The headquarters of Asian Development Bank is in Manila. Why do you think they put it in Manila? Because Manila was the China of Asia in the early 1960s and late 1950s. We were the fastest growing economy back then. That's why they put it in, in the Philippines. And then within five years, we became sick man of Asia. Obviously, they didn't foresee that. So if culture is the explanation, back then there was a time that we were ahead of Koreans, and then now they're just ahead of us recently, right? Korea is like a 2,000-year history. It was only in the last 30 years that Korea became rich. So if culture is explanation, why was Korea poor all those times? And I can go on, on and on with this argument, right? Again, lazy argumentation when you go to culture. This is a lazy man way of explaining things. Unfortunately, this is what many people buy because who listens to people like me, right? Okay, maybe man, many people, but anyways, let's not go. Um, and a definitional deficit. I don't mean culture. What do you really mean by culture? Because culture could be interchangeable with institutions, with a lot of other words. So we'll try to go to that later. But anyways, culture as we understand it, probably in a colloquial layman's term, I think is a very poor explanation. And I use no less than the work of people like Max Weber to show you how wrong that is. Because societies change and cultures are malleable, right? Yes? So in short, my pag pa for us to get worse or better, right? Next. Okay, then what? Next. Actually, policies matter. Uh, these are just a number of books. I don't have time to go through them. Next. Next. Okay, what these books are showing is that one of the reasons why certain countries became very successful only in the last 40, 50 years is because they adopted a specific kind of policies, right? Specifically, trade and industrial policy. Those were very relevant elements, right? I'm getting into a little bit dangerous zone, but 1960s, Philippines and South Korea were exactly almost, mid-1960s, exactly almost the same level of per capita income. They got a dictator called Park Chung-hee. We got a national hero. Now, um, <laughs> that's mid-1960s. By late 1980s, South Korea was at least three times richer than the Philippines. You can check that fact. I'm not making this up. This is not Dilawan propaganda. This is fact. The difference was the policies that South Korea adopted in the, in, during Park Chung-hee versus the policy we adopted during those years, right? Golden years, if you want to put it. Now, this is not about personality. This is about differences in policies. What South Korea did was this. South Korea, in an economic sense, had no comparative advantage. They created their own comparative advan advantage through very aggressive trade and industrial policy. Right. I think one of the best books that covered that is actually the book, How Asia Works. And look, it has like 100 pages of bibliography. It's, it's amazingly well researched. And the argument was the first thing that allowed South Korea, Taiwan, and Japan, among others, to unleash growth was land reform. Because what does land reform do? Land reform allows for a lot of poor people to get decent jobs. And the beauty with small land is that you can do gardening, right? While if plantation, Actually, there's a lot of waste in plantation, right? Yes, there's economies of scale, but there's a lot of waste. Studies actually show that small fields can be more, better tilted if one farmer does it. So my potato ka dito, my cabbage ka dito, blah, blah, blah. 
So one of the first things that land reform does is that it creates growth in the rural areas, right? The other thing they did is they focused on export-oriented industrialization, which Philippines also did, with one big difference, right? The economic term for that is reciprocal mechanism. I'll tell you, I'll explain to you very, so I'm, just, I'm gonna really simplify the story here, right? So Park Chung-hee, one night, called all the oligarchs of South Korea, the guys who are, they call them chables, right? He said, I want you guys to make big industries. No mga panahon na yan, mga oligarchs were into familiar stuff, hacendero, eh, retail industry, stuff like that, right? Very similar to what we have today. He told them, I want you to make me big industries. If you don't do that, I will confiscate your, um, your assets. One of the Chabol leaders, the head of what will become Samsung later on, he got to know about that meeting because they were called to the Blue Palace. Uh, he escaped to Japan temporarily. <laughs> but anyways, one of the companies was called LG. And the LG guy, they, he told the LG guy, I want you to make satellite and television for me. The LG guy said, sir, we have no competencies whatsoever. You're forcing us to make something we can't. He said, I'll give you three years and I'll give you the money. If you don't do that in a certain year, I'll take out your business. Guess what? Within eight months, they already had a German partner. And within 10 years, LG already had the basic uh, industrial base. So what happened was that you had a strong leader, right? Who at the same time had the right policy in mind and he bullied the chables, right? To take up the right set sort of business. But there was something called reciprocal mechanism. Hindi siya unconditional cash transfer. It was a very conditional cash transfer. So they probably started with 100 chables and the inefficient chables will be gobbled up by the efficient chables, and he will pump money into them, pump money into them, pump money, until they became world class. So he made it very clear, you'll only get support from the state and you will not be dissolved if you meet certain standards, especially export standards. He was very clear about that. The difference in the Philippines and many other failed experiences of industrialization was there was no reciprocal mechanism. The people who got the money from the state, meaning our tax money, our hard work, were cronies who just wasted the money, had no competence, there was no reciprocal mechanism, there was no punishment. And in the end, all their debt was assumed by the country, which of course we're still paying today. That was this crucial difference between their industrialization strategy and our industrial strategy. And the last factor was also financial regulation, right? There was a very tight financial regulation to make sure that ordinary people cannot access uh, dollar money, right? So there was also a lot of oppression of ordinary people to raise the funds to give to the chables. In fact, the chables and, uh, and the experiences of industrialization in Taiwan, they did not rely a lot on technology transfers. They actually tried to develop the technologies themselves by buying through royalties. And the other beautiful thing about, for instance, in South Korea was they never trusted one country, so they will consult three different competitors on how to get the, con the technology, an Italian, a German, and a Japanese one. And then they'll make them fight among each other to get the cheapest out of them, right? I'm, I'm simplifying the story. It's really complicated, but this is what happened in only 20 years. And South Korea went from dirt poor country to one of the biggest shipbuilders in the world, right? And manufacturers in the world. And from around 200 chables, now you're down to only four major chables in South Korea, right? That's a problem a little bit, but these are highly competitive chables which provide significant amount of jobs. And manufacturing is important because it provides good paying jobs on a large scale that, I don't know, jobs in SM or whatever cannot provide, right? In services sector cannot provide. So I'm very much simplifying the story. And then of course, sweater din ang South Korea. That if other countries did a good job, then South Korea would not be as competitive. So, dahil malas yung iba, suerte din sila. Because this is a competitive market. It's, it's not really as win-win as people think. Globalization is a little bit Darwinian. Okay, let's go through that. So what I'm telling you is policies matter, right? It's not only personalities, it's policies. Next. But of course, it also raises the question, uh, you and I can have same policies. It's not like policies are magic. You can download it on the internet. You can get a smart advisor. But why certain countries were more effective in implementing that policy than the others? And that's where you have to go to the strength of institutions. But I'll go through that a little bit later on. Um, so the question is, siguro kailang ba authoritarian tayo, no? Baka they'll say, if you have authoritarian leadership, it's easier to implement this policy than having democratic leadership, right? Next. Um, so that's where the idea comes from, the idea of, you know, strong men comes from, right? Remember a while ago I was talking about um, Park Chung-hee, right? And Park Chung-hee was, of course, a dictator, right? Albeit a benign one. And if you look at 
contemporary historical analysis or you look at social science history, they always tell to reduce history to a work of one man, right? And I think the best rebuttal against that is War and Peace by Tolstoy. If you have read War and Peace, he shows that history is driven by impersonal forces. It's as much driven by ordinary soldiers on the front than by generals. The generals are just cog in a bigger machine. Nonetheless, the idea that one man can solve a society's problem is very powerful today, especially when we're in fear, we're in uncertainty. Let's just go quickly through this because it's a little bit controversial. Um, so the idea there is that political will is the solution. So during election, all you need to do is just look for a person with political will. Forget about his background, forget about his policies, kahit wala siyang alam, kahit ayun na mathematics, wala siyang alam sa economics, basta may political will, right? This is where the genesis is from, this Napoleonic complex, right? That if you have a Napoleon, you'll suddenly be great overnight, right? Next. And of course today, this is very, this is the trend now, so it's not just one or two countries around the world, next. Uh, and very interesting, if you look at the results. Now, if you want to measure success, if you want to measure success, the best measurement for that is Human Development Index, not GDP growth. Because Human Development Index looks at levels of education, literacy, life expectancies, and income. So I think it's a better measure of successful by isang gobyerno or hindi. So yung HDI mo. If you look at the table there, do you notice something? What are the top three countries? Are they democracies or autocracies? They're all autocracies, right? Of course, Indonesia changed, I'm sorry, Tunisia changed, right? But throughout the years from 1980 onwards, most, these countries were mostly autocracies. And these are the most successful countries in terms of raising their HDI, right? So, mukhang may solution tayo, di ba? That means you need to be authoritarian. Except, look at the bottom of the list. Mali, Burundi, Niger. This is the problem. Authoritarian regimes are hit or miss, right? They can be successful, some of them, but if you go look, look at the bottom of the list of most unstable countries, biggest droughts, biggest tra tragedies, they're actually authoritarian system. And the reason is why is because you have no checks and balances, right? Uh, two economists did a very good research on that. Uh, one of them was, of course, Joseph Stiglitz. Um, this idea that if you look at man-made disasters, majority of these disasters were actually in authoritarian systems, right? While economic miracles were also, also in authoritarian system. So in short, it's a very risky thing to rely on authoritarian regime to deliver economic growth. And you have greater numbers of failure than success, and this clearly shows that. Of course, we can zoom it out, and we can see that. It's a little bit more complicated, but I'm simplifying to you, right? That when people say, Ah, tignan mo Singapore, napaka successful. You're like you're only looking at the top of the list. You're not looking at the bottom of the list, right? Okay, next. So this is what I would, so actually democracies on average perform averagely, which is much better than hit or miss. Because there's another twist to the story. Sometimes authoritarian regimes do well during takeoff economic level of development, but they also tend to hit what economists call middle income trap. Pagdating sa middle income level, hindi na sila efficiente. Because for you to move to high income level, you need a what? A free innovative society, right? And free innovative societies. Look at which are the most innovative countries in the world. If you look at the World Economic Forum's list, which countries do you think are top of the list? South Korea, right? Scandinavian countries, Germany, United States. These are the most innovation driven countries and all of them are democracies. So autocracies are good going from low level of income to middle income, but once you want to go to high income, actually democracies are much better. So as I always say, for every Lee Kuan Yew that you cite me, I can cite you a lot of Mugabe's, Gaddafi's, and Idi Amin's, right? This is the problem we have. Next. Next, okay. So these are the good guys, supposedly, although there is some debate about... I mean, first of all, Singapore, by the way, are to our good friends in Singapore, Singapore is just a city-state, okay? It's not a country, right? Um, it's not a full country with full rural urban dynamics, right? It's like meron lang tayong BGC or Makati, right? Uh, and Malaysia, of course, yes, quite successful country, but Malaysia has oil and very relatively small population. So you also have to keep those things also in mind when we talk about this. Success cases. Nonetheless, all respect to Mahathir, especially Mahathir, 93 year old, who never misses any meeting. Even if he's 93 year old, wala siyang excuse, um, unlike some other people. And, uh, um, 
And then compare that to other autocrats who started very successfully, like Gaddafi, our friend, 1960s, 1970s. And then look at Libya towards the end of Gaddafi's rule, right? Gaddafi is really a really interesting guy, right? Uh, I, I heard a lot of interesting stories. Um, one story was one of his best friends was this Italian leader called Silvio Berlusconi, right? And then they will have like party, bonga bonga party with uh, supermodels. And then at the end of the parties, he will go to each supermodel and give them a copy of his green book, which is his constitution, and then $100. <laughs> he was a really weird guy, super weird guy. Uh, you know Christian Amanpour of CNN, right? She said she, once she went to interview uh, Gaddafi in the 1990s or 2000s, um, and Gaddafi was in the palace, and Gaddafi said to Amanpour, no, this palace it doesn't feel like home. Let's go to somewhere which looks more like my home. So apparently, of course, Gaddafi comes from a Bedouin background. So they went outside the palace, and then there's a tent. And then they went inside the tent, and then they're like, they're like goats around and just like chewing grass. <laughs> and Amanpur was saying, I had a very hard time focusing on the questions I want to raise at him because we're inside this weird tent inside the mansion, right, with goats chewing on the grass around us, right? He was a really weird guy. In fact, Gaddafi, uh, just before he died, he gave a four-hour speech in United Nations. And then by the third hour, Biglang, there was a sound of collapse. The interpreter just fainted. <laughs> he gave three hours of the most incoherent. Maybe we beat that record already. But he gave the, he gave the most incoherent speech in history of humanity. Like ranting about his father, his brothers, and then cussing at Italianos, and then saying America. And then the, the interpreter just like, boom, he just crashed like the third hour. <laughs> so they had to change the guy. So. Gaddafi, very interesting guy, but of course he was, he was killed in a very horrible way. Um, don't watch it, but it's on live leak if it's still there. Next, I love this guy, Mugabe, right? Look at, look at the style, right? <laughs> so Mugabe started as this great freedom, right? Pro, actually, he's, he, he's, he's very articulate. If you watch his earlier uh, speeches in the 80s and 90s, he was like a freedom leader, para siyang ane, Che Guevara. And then, and then Zimbabwe became... Zimbabwe, right? They had what? What was their inflation the other year? One million percent. Venezuela just beat that, by the way, I think, recently. One million percent inflation. Can you imagine that? So there were Zimbabwe people who had to get coins and put it in a sack and then go to the shop to get like three-in-one coffee. It became ridiculous at some point in time in Harare. And this guy started well, and then he became crazy and corrupt, right? Guess what? He's the dictator. You can't do anything about him. And he's still there. And he's still there. He, he was kicked out in a coup d'etat. Zimbabwe is a country with high levels of HIV and very low life expectancy. Average Zimbabweans live around 40 years. He's already reaching 90 years. So he's literally like a demigod among Zimbabweans. And you can see literally the level of his comfort versus average Zimbabweans, right? This is the problem. Even when dictators start well, they deteriorate significantly because absolute power corrupts absolutely. This is the problem we have. Next. That's why if you go to the record of 10 most corrupt leaders according to Transparency International and on Forbes magazine, Filipino Pride, <laughs> practically all are dictators or populists, right? Or combination. You won't find a single democratic leader. You won't find Barack Obama there. You won't find FDR there. Yeah, sure, everyone corrupts. Sure, in politics it's corrupt, but it's degrees, my friend. It's degrees, right? It's like billions of degrees, right? Um, next, let's go. So this is, again, Human Development Index. So this is what I was telling you, right? So if you look at China, uh, very, very impressive young level of rising and Human Development Index. But look at the less, least improved one. Mostly uh, authoritarian countries, and look at how erratic they are, right? They're so erratic. This is the problem with authoritarianism. They go up and down and up and down. And that destroys institutions, that destroys people's mind when you go like that. This is the problem. They grow 10% and then 2% and then they shrink and then they go up again. China so far has been an exception, really interesting exception. But China is still a poor country with a per capita of $8,000, right? To be a high income, you have to be at least above 12,000. Let's see what China will do in the coming years. They're already seeing problems. If you go to China, uh, I was in Beijing. I don't believe there's 6 7% growth rate. I, I think they're just going 3 or 4%. You know, when you travel a lot, you can feel levels of growth. You can feel it. 
a country that grows 7-8%, you can feel it in the numbers of new buildings being built and bridges and all. You can feel it. And I've been in Beijing over the times. Uh, although ngayon, ang ganda ng treatment sa akin bilang Filipino. In, uh, iba eh. No? <laughs> Even when I was in North Korea. No? I was in North Korea in April, um, part of a delegation. And I was very, very jealous because I was with other ASEAN people and Indonesians were there and the Indonesian would say, oh, your great leader, Kim Il-sung, was the good friend of my great leader, Sukarno, and then they will talk, talk, talk. And then Vietnam, oh, communist regime, brothers, brothers, fight, imperialists. Yeah. And then Cambodia, oh, our leader, uh, uh, what was the leader of, 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 of Cambodia? The Sihanouk. Sihanouk had the palace, blah, blah, blah. And then it came to me, it's like, oh, shoot, I have no story. Like, and then uh, they said to me, how is President Duterte? <laughs> I said, President Duterte, yeah. You know the Juche diplomacy, right? Juche means self-sufficiency in Korean, right? I said, my president also has a Juche diplomacy, right? A little bit more colorful than yours then. <laughs> and then, you know, so, and then I got to know two months after I left South North Korea, PDP Laban signed a cooperation agreement with Workers' Party of North Korea. Did you know that our ruling party, assuming they're still around, um, has only three cooperation agreements with three parties. Guess which countries? North Korea, Russia, and China. Very interesting. But anyways, let's move on. But you, you see the point, right? I'm just digressing. Maybe we can go quickly through the next ones. Now, let's, let's go through them. <laughs> let's go. Okay, next. Next. Okay, okay. You, you, get, you get the point. I want to move on. I'm in solid north. Okay, and let's go next. <laughs> but I'll just keep it here. Just read what Lee Kuan Yew said. Just keep it there, okay? You can read it for yourself, okay? Okay, let's go. <laughs> now, the problem also we face today is this. If I were to agree that actually authoritarian leaders did well in the 20th century, let's assume that the parallel universe of golden age was true. Let's just assume. There's another problem we're facing today. I really suggest you read this book by Mo Moises Naim, a former Venezuelan diplomat and chief editor of Foreign Policy Magazine. He's a really good, a really smart guy. His argument is that power operates differently in the 21st century as opposed to 20th century. In the 20th century, walang social media, information was traveling very slow. You could control information. Mamatay na ngayon leader mo, hindi mo pa alam, di ba? Ngayon, hindi pa nga namamatay, pinapatay na, di ba? Just go. Na wala lang, sabi ko nga ngayon, ang uso hindi na Facebook Live, eh, Facebook Alive. Kailangan mag-Facebook Alive. Buhay pa pala si ano, Pangulo, no? Um, things have changed significantly. My God. Because there are just more people and numbers create new quality and dynamics. Uh, there's also mobility. People are moving much faster. Time and space is shrinking. So we are in a much more complex era. Whereby in the old age... One man, if you're really smart, probably could figure out things. Now, no more. I said, if one day I wake up and like by some magic, I'm a Filipino president, the first thing I'll do is I'll have a proclamation calling on all smart Filipinos around the world, including in Baguio, especially here probably. We will do big data analysis because things are so complicated. We cannot do the old ways. It's all big data analysis. That's the only way to figure things out, right? And then like Macron, I'll make my own on Marsh, right? Uh, that's how to do it. And if you look at on Marsh of Macron, who are the people there? Top environmentalists, top mathematician, top this, top that. He's the, these are the best and brightest of France. But France is mess anyway, but let's forget about it. Let's go next. Tsaka medyo ano lang, bling bling lang masyado si Macron. So if you look at the record, uh, you go like big works, Rushir Sharma and Zaworski. These are the classic works and also Rushir Sharma, of course. He's the guy who handles $700 billion in Morgan Stanley. He knows what he's talking about. His argument is that there's no evidence to show that on average autocracies do better than democracies, right? So if you look at all case studies around the world, it's very clear that this idea that you need a strong man and things will be fine, actually it doesn't hold water. And for me, it's even going to be worse in the 21st century because it's even more complicated, right? Next. Uh, so what explains the event? Let's go next. I'll try to go a little bit. So I, of course, I'm sure you're familiar with this book. Why my, my nations fail? Because the argument there is what matters is institutions. Although I have some problems with the book because it's a bit vague. Next. Um, but their argument is this. Uh, two factors that make a country successful is to have inclusive political institutions and inclusive economic institutions. In layman terms, what does it mean? Inclusive political institutions means hindi yung magkapatid nag para maging mayor ng commercial hub ng bansa mo. Hindi yung mag-asawa nag for District 1 and District 2 ng city mo. Right? Hindi yung kapatid, kapatid, tatay, lahat ng mayor, vice mayor, congressman, right? 
that, that's an extractive political institution. Inclusive means even an average Joe, if I'm a smart guy, if I can speak well, if I'm educated, if I care, I can raise money, I don't have to rely on oligarchs or my dad's money, right? And I can run for office because I'll be given a fair share of public space and people will vote for me for my merit. That's an inclusive political institution. What is an extractive versus inclusive economic institution? Purong SM, SM, SM. <laughs> right? Uh, versus small and medium enterprises, right? Dominating the economy, right? So extractive is when, this is the number in the Philippines, this is the number in the Philippines. 40 families took home 76% of newly created growth. 0.0000001% of the population took home 5% out of the 6% of our growth. That's mind boggling. That's, that's just the greatest injustice, right? We have the highest levels of growth concentration in Asia. That's why what I say is, you know, when I feel more at home in Mexico than in Malaysia, right? Because our country is much more similar to Latin American countries in all good but also very bad ways, right? So if you watch Narcos, you know, Hacienda, womanizing, killing, self-righteousness, and then corruption, very similar, right? Um, and, but guess what? Our level of political concentration is even higher than Mexico. So in, Mex in Mexico, right, 40% of the legislatures come from political dynasties. In Argentina, it's around 12%. U.S. is only 2 to 3%, you know, the Clintons, Kennedys. But there's very small numbers in the Bushes. Um, the Philippines, interesting, I saw two numbers. You, one number was... 70% of, of, of our people in the Congress are from political dynasties. And then I saw a different number that puts it at 90%. And I wondered why. So it reminded me of this story. I, I had a Russian diplomat friend. Ito yung time na hindi pa nila sinuguran yung Ukraine. After that, ayoko na sila. And then, nakatakot na ngayon. Anyways, let's move forward. Sabi ng Russian, sabi niya, Richard, you have a very weird democracy. He said, nakatira kasi sa BGC, no? So there was a barangay there. He said, you know, I look at the, now, uh, at the name of officials. The officials in our barangay, of course, I'll have to delete it, right? He said, it's like, De La Cruz, De La Cruz, De La Cruz, De La Cruz. And then there was one Reyes. And then I asked, who is that Reyes? Oh, he's the brother-in-law, you know. <laughs> he said, what kind of democracy you have? I said, it's, at least it's not mafia state like yours, you know, like we had back and forth. So apparently, it jumps up to 90% kung binilang mo yung mga anak sa labas. <laughs> this is crazy. This is crazy levels of political and economic concentration. That is why I understand the emergence of what we call grievance politics. That is why I understand why 2016 was a protest vote, more than anything else. Because it was not only the presidency, the vice presidency went to the son of President Marcos. That was a slap on the face of the elites that replaced Marcos. That, that was the biggest slap. Almost went, by the way. Almost, okay? There's still a case. I don't want to preempt that. But you get my point here, right? So what is the problem in the Philippines? The problem in the Philippines is that we don't have either inclusive political institution or inclusive economic institutions. China actually has inclusive economic institutions because ordinary Chinese incomes is rising, but still closed political institutions. Us, neither of the two. This is the problem we face. So in a way, actually, ironically, I will agree, China may be more democratic than the Philippines if democracy is about inclusiveness. Do you get my point? Okay, next. We're going to pick up speed. So these are just some of the graphs to show you countries who are successful cases of growth, not so successful. So may kita mo yung Filipinas, tying lag behind countries. We're only catching up now, right? Which is quite sad, but actually, at least we're catching up. So there are four types of countries. At least hindi a trapped country, right? Wala na, parang you're stuck in a bad relationship, kung maga wala na, hopeless case. Ito, medyo may, ano na, recovery na. And then other fast-growing growth, ibig sabihin, hindi super high level. But I think the Philippines will graduate to B soon, if we keep up our growth of 6 to 8%. So magbi B na tayo soon. And then A are the successful industrialized countries, right? So I suggest look at the case of these countries and what great policies they did to be successful. Now, we're almost done. Can we just breeze through it? So these are successful countries. Next. Now, I want to just go to how success came about. Oh, my God, I still have a lot to discuss. Can we just breeze through it? Okay, so the next question we have is, I'll go very fast through it because we, we, we need to have time. Um, baka naman ang sagot sa Pilipinas is, ano ba tong extractive, inclusive, complicated na yan? Let's just change the form of government, right? 
Mag-federalism tayo para walang problema, di ba? <laughs> so, <laughs> maybe, right? Let's go federalism. Um, the problem though is if you, to, you, you, if you discuss federalism, it's not really a change in system, but it's just only a change in form of government, right? But form also matters. If you go back to the works of Aristotle, one of the greatest contributions of Aristotle was he made a distinction between form and substance, right? So form is manner, presentation, packaging. Substance is the content, right? Whatever. Um, sabi niya, ito, hiwala yung dalawa, but form influences the expression of the substance. It's a little bit vague, but you, I suppose you get what I'm saying, right? Um, packaging, kumbaga, pinapaganda yung contento, right? So while they're different, they're, in, they're, in, they're mutually actually uh, reinforcing, right? So it's just because I'm saying you're just changing form of government doesn't mean that it will never have an impact on substance. But the qu big, big question I have is because I don't have enough time, I will show you three countries with exactly the same form of government, right? Presidential, parliamentary, and federal, right? Right? And let's look at these countries. Very interesting. So the first one is, let's go next. So France. So France, these are the indicators, G8 countries, blah, 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 blah. Fantastic. France, the best, whatever. Next, Turkey. Erdogan. A little bit more questionable in levels of uh, press freedom. Turkey has most number of journalists in jail, for instance. And they had a coup d'etat. And then, of course, South Korea. Uh, if you look at South Korea, they actually have, some of their indicators are even better than France. They actually beat Europe in terms of economic competitiveness, in terms of democracy, right? They put a corrupt president in jail recently, um, <laughs> among other things, right? Um, now, so you, of course, it's ridiculous for me to say that just because they have the same form of government, overnight they'll all be the same. The way to analyze it is this. Let's say three different countries adopt diff the same form of government, but from different starting points. So in isa, nagsimula siya habang PhD siya, siya master, isa undergraduate. But the assumption is that if three of them adopt the right form of government, and form of government is important, di ba dapat over time nagka-converge na sila? Kasi kung yun yung solution, di nang... The problem though is Turkey, for instance, is not converging, while South Korea is actually doing even better than France. So you don't have convergence, you actually have divergence that is happening. Which shows, in basic logic, the correlation is weak between form of government and trajectory of economic development and democratization. Do you get what I'm saying? You can do the, reg it's a regression analysis, right? So I'll start year 1950, South Korea, Turkey, and France started with this level of development, same form of government. If the correlation is strong, if, if there's causality, they have to converge in 50 years. They are not converging. Nako, dami nagalit sa akin nung nagbibiginigay ko to. Si Joey Salceda, nag-question uh, nag and answer. He gave a 40 minutes intervention. <laughs> and I said, alam mo, Joey, pag lahat ng mga governor pa siya nun eh, pag lahat ng governor kasing galing mo, pro-federalism ako. Kaso hindi eh. <laughs> But next, let's just go through that. I'll, I just, we don't have time for that. So what I'm saying is that don't fall for monocausal explanation. Wag tayo pa uto sa mga, ay pag uh, federalism tayo, solve yung problema natin. I even heard our, our dear leader, he said that, gusto ko federalism like, like, like Singapore. Singapore? Are you kidding me? So my friend in Singapore said, ay, hindi ko pa alam yung, yung kalsada pala namin, federal state na po. <laughs> Kasi city state lang naman ng Singapore. And so, I want also mixed uh, presidential, like France. But France is not even federal. So my understanding is the president doesn't know what he's talking about on federalism. What the president wants is decentralization, which I agree with. You don't need to go federal to decentralize, right? This is the problem. And then you must sa paligid ni Pang Duterte have their own agenda, and then they're kind of using that for their own purposes. This is the problem I see today, right? I'll, I don't have time to go through it. Pero nung nagbigay ako ng speech, so si Nene Pimentel sa umaga, ako yung sa hapon. So malamang si Nene Pimentel, pro-pro. Ako naman, ang style ko, octopus, no? On one hand, on the other hand, on this hand, on that hand. So you end up more confused but at a higher level, right? After my speech. Um, <laughs> Ito yung maganda, question and answer. So yung isang, munti ko sinabi yung pangalan, yung isang political dynasty, tumaas siya, sabi niya, Sir, may question ako, Prof, sabi niya. Ano, ano yun? Um, pag federal po tayo, ano po yung mga bagong opisina na bubukas? <laughs> Ay, alam ko na. 
Because under federalism, you're gonna have a state legislature, probably a state parliament. Yung pala, yung iba, tinitignan nila new offices that will be opened. Because there'll be duplication of bureaucracy and duplication of elected office, right? So actually, maraming tayo may iba't ibang agenda dyan. No? It's not necessary for more power to the peripheries. Tagabagyo ako, so I'm sorry, mas galit kami sa Imperial Manila kaysa sa inyo sa Davao. Malayo nga kayo. We have to deal with this mayabang Manilenyo all day, right? <laughs> Kaya every time I hear, I, I'll try to speak a little bit Ilocano, baka madiscriminate din ako dito. Eh. Um, so my point here is, I think there's no, the president doesn't clearly know what he's talking about. No offense, I mean, he's a lawyer, whatever he is, um, uh, a prosecutor. This is political science, and people around him have their own agenda. I'm very worried about that. Of course, there's also the worst agenda. Actually, there are two Trojan horse arguments, the good Trojan horse and the bad Trojan horse. The good Trojan horse is by some of my colleagues who are part of the Constitutional Commission. Ang argumento nila ay ganito. Yung ating saligang batas ngayon ay masyadong anti-Marcos, hindi niya pinag-isipan yung kailangan natin or mga pangangailangan natin in the 21st century. For instance, six years is ridiculous. You know why? Because it's too long for a bad president. But it's too short for a good president. That's why the U.S. is much better. You have two terms, 4-4, four, four. Indonesia 5-5. Five, five. So kung umayos ka sa first term, marielek ka. Kung ewan ka, hindi ka marielek. So meron ka incentive to actually do well. Six years, it's not long enough for a good president. There will not be continuity. Knowing the Philippines is always anti-incumbency. presidents, Philippine presidency is one of the most dangerous jobs because most likely you're going to go to jail or you're going to be threatened with jail once you're out, right? So continuity is not the case. This is the problem we have. I, political dynasties, hindi ko alam sinong genius ang gumawa ng sa, ating saligang bata. I really get frustrated. Whereby you have an anti-dynasty provi uh, provision, but you, not, you have no executory provisions. You have an anti-dynasty principle, whatever, but you don't have executory. And then umaasa ka sa Congresso na purong political dynasty to pass that law, they're not going to do that. right? They should have done that self-executory provision from the very foundation of the Constitution. And they didn't do that. So some of my good friends who were part of the Constitutional Commission, ang sabi nila is, kailangan natin ng federalism para masingit natin yung mamatitinong reforma. Including anti-defection. Ang dali magpalit ng partido dito. Which is ridiculous. Bakit, why would a Filipino vote based on policy and merit when there's no clear policy? It's all about personality. And how can it not be about personality when you don't have clear parties? Because people can easily shift parties. In other countries, if you shift parties, mabawal ka tumakbo sa next election. There's a kind of para my grace period, my probation. You have to stay for two years. Like these are common sense, 101. We have among the best, most erudite lawyers. Right? And uh, we're among the best English speaking people, and yet our constitution is one of the worst written in terms of grammatics. Like, nabasa niyo yung constitution natin, compared to the US constitution, US constitution is so thin, so simple, so understandable. The Philippine constitution is ungrammatic, written by lawyers that if they were doing journalism, probably purong rejected yung articles nila. They won't be able to write for New York Times or something like that for sure. Um, and the other thing is, with all the good lawyer mind we had, we didn't think about these things. That's where I'm kind of shocked. So I'm for amendment of our constitution. But the question is, is this the right way? Federalism, should it do a whole package, right? So let's just bleach through things. And then, I mean, let's go, 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 go. I'll go back to that later on. Let's go back to that slide towards the end, though. That slide, can you keep in mind? Yeah, sorry, next. Go, 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 next, 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 next. Oh, uh, next, next. The other, pro see, yeah, next. Okay, can we go back? Can we go back? The other the other problem have with federalism. Nag apply po kayo ng grant ever. But you know the idea of a grant, di ba? Pag nag apply ka ng grant, sir, may proposal po ako, itong gusto kong project, no? Ang gagawin mo most of the time, if it's a big project, may pilot project ka, no? So, sh prototype, no? Pakita mo yung prototype mo gumana para they can fund you on a grander scale. Guess what? We already have a pilot project of federalism. It's called ARMM. Isn't ARMM a great example of giving more autonomy? fiscal, cultural, otherwise, to a region to see if it works. And guess what happened to ARMM? It got even worse in terms of its levels of power and growth. So if you go to the next slides, not very successful, right? Even Cordillera, we wanted to have an experience on that. So my point is, I use mo na yung pilot project mo. In fact, we'll have a bigger pilot project called Bangsamoro next year. I use niyo muna yan bago kayo maging ambisyoso na nationwide, right? This is the problem I have. It doesn't follow the common procedures. Next. Next, next, let's just go through that. Oh, okay. 
this is another thing I love. When people talk about federalism, they talk about Singapore. Uh, <laughs> they talk about Switzerland and Germany. Okay, fantastic. But are those countries even comparable to us? They're not. The basic rule in comparative politics or analysis is to compare apples and apples, not half rotten oranges and shiny snow white apples, right? Doesn't make sense, right? So why don't they cite instead countries who have the same level of development like us and our federalism? Guess what? Mexico, favorite of President Duterte, narco state, Nigeria, Brazil, Venezuela, India, Iraq. Actually, there's Somalia and others, but I won't mention them. But uh, major hindi na comparable sa atin. Why not look at this country and see if federalism work for them? If you look at this country, federalism has been actually so-so, right? Not super successful, not total failure. This is my problem. The job of the government when they push for a reform is to provide pros and cons, not to only provide pros. Otherwise, it's called propaganda. I love it. If you go to the Facebook page, I don't know. Pumunta ako sa Facebook page ng PDP Laban a few months ago. And then, meron, meron punch ganun the Terta Face. And then nakalagay, yes to federalism, no to drugs. So my problem is, how do you argue with that? So kung, kung hindi ka pro-federalism, pro-drugs ka, it's just ridiculous, right? And then chinismi sa akin ni, uh, ni, ni Chelito Habito, among others, yung pala, pag yung mga DLG pumunta around the country, ganito ang explanation nila ng federalism. So, wala na yung mga PowerPoint na yan. Wala yan, laos yan. Sabi na, oh, ilang beses, kumain na ba kayo sa isang, uh, kumain na ba kayo today? Tapos, oh, kumain na po. Ilang, ilang beses po kayo kumain? Isang beses po. Ayan. Pag federalism po, apat na beses po tayo kakain. <laughs> Which reminded me of the, uh, the Senate campaign of someone whereby, meron may spoof na pag ako nanalo, maraming, maraming pagkain. Alam mo yun? Para, eh, eh, well, let's not go there. Anyways, um, this is the problem. <laughs> this is the problem. Our government is not doing a job of actually raising a public discussion over this issue. What they're doing is they're giving overly simplistic, if not completely idiotic, representation of a very important issue, which could bring us to hell or heaven or, or completely neutral and unnecessary, right? I'm more of that latter argument. Next. Um, last, let's go, let's go. Um, next, next. Okay. Ito pa yung isa pang problema. Can we go back? Next. Money. Hindi po libre. Pumalit ng form of government. Uh, menu cost ang tawag dyan sa economics, right? I mean, if magpalit ka ng itsura ng restaurant mo, magbayad ka ng... Uh, it's not free. They're gonna use our taxpayers' money for that. So if you're going to use my money, prove to me it makes sense. Otherwise, don't waste my time. What really got me worried is, nung nalaman ko, yung Constitutional Commission na nagumawa ng draft, whatever you want to call it, they had not a single economist. They had political scientists, lawyers, business management people, not a single economist. That is why their calculations were way off, way off the track. Kaya pala, also, can we go to the next slides? Next slides. According to NEDA, so there's a transition cost and then there's a post-transition cost, which means new offices. So may, yung isa parang adjustment, yung isa, it's going to be in 500 billion pesos probably. That's 10 million dollars? Right? I mean, this is the upper limit. But you're talking about billions of dollars here, my friend, right? You're going to waste billions of dollars. You have to explain to me why this is a good thing. But the biggest problem for me is this. Uh, can you go next? Yes, my former professor, Professor Pilapil of UP Diliman, he's leading this study, very interesting study, and I really suggest look at his work. Sabi niya, pinag-aralan niyo yung tatlong draft ng federalismo. The constitutional draft, which is the best one, the PDP Laban version, which is interesting, and then there's another draft, which is by some congressman there, I forgot their name, no offense, sorry. Um, and if you look at all three of them, there is one crucial element missing. The crucial element is transition plan. There's no from plan A to plan uh, How do you go from A to B? There's no transition plan. And that's dangerous. Because kung wala kang transition plan, in fact, if tinignan mo yung Federalism Constitutional Commission's draft, ang sinasabi nila dyan is, bobo ulit ng gobyerno ng isang federal transition committee that will be appointed by the president and then bahala na sila mag-figure it out. That's not a draft. That's like a draft about an, another draft. If you were my student, I'll fail you all. I'm sorry, you're incomplete. I am Sitai, diba? In, in, in UP. Incomplete, yeah. Um, and these are the problems. Next. So these are jargons. But one of the things I didn't take into consideration is 
porkit pinalitan mo yung batas, hindi ibig sabihin iba rin yung behavior ng tao. Case in point, nakita niyo yung party list. If you look at the law, the party list was one of the most brilliant ideas there, right? The idea of party list is, ako, simpleng tao, lumalaban para sa karapatan ng mga manggagawa, right? So, hindi ako mananalo sa district kasi perahan lang dyan. So, pag representative ako ng party list, proportionally, I may have a chance to win because there is a reserve seat for marginalized groups. And then, a few years ago, we got to see that Mikey Arroyo was the party list representative of security guards, right? And I don't know how on earth that happened, right? And then, Bongka Usun is now running for, is it the Lomads or what is their party list? Like, whatever. Anyways, look at how they adulterated. I'm using a much better term. There's another term, but adulterated party list system. Party list system now is a way for trapos to win in a cheaper way. Because party list, kailangan mo lang 200,000 votes, pwede ka na maging congressman. Congressman, mahirap minsan. 500,000, 1 million votes. So, it, see how the law was co-opted by the system. So, it's very simplistic to say, ay, kung pinalitan natin dito, biglang babait lahat. Hindi, mag-aanap ng butas yan. Right? So, don't over-promise that change in law will bring change in behavior. Among other things. Law of unintended consequences and other things. So, let's, let's go quickly through that. Um, cautionary tale. By the way, people forget the U.S. Was federal for 200 years and so, and people forget that the U.S. had a civil war when one million people almost got killed, right? Because federalism could be great, but in very the highly divided societies, it could actually further reinforce divisions, right? I and mean, if you've been to the U.S., go to a place like New York or California, wonderful. But if you go through, I don't know, I'm not going to name this, but there's certain states there, right? Maybe you don't want to go there if you look like me, you know, can be mistaken, either Mexican or Muslim or something like that. But anyways, let's let's move forward. So my argument is. First of all, if, if federalism is the answer, what is the question? Claro yung dapat ng gobyerno sa Anong kaya, what, what is it that we're trying to solve? The second is, ito pa yung nakakatakot. Sabi nila, ang magpo-form ng new constitutional draft, the final draft, will be actually the congressmans themselves. Instead of a constituent assembly, which means us. So, the, the, so this is the weird thing. So you want na matanggal yung trapos through a new constitution, pero iwanan mo sa trapos to make that new constitution, <laughs> major weird, right? Um, so even the plan of transition on who drafts it is for me problematic too, right? Uh, and then for me, uh, the question is, will the charter change really deal with a serious problem in the country, which is extractive political institutions and extractive economic institutions? Will it change political dynasty problems? Will it change few big businessmen controlling this country? If you cannot answer that question, get out of my, my, my room, right? Or get out of my face, right? And let's go to the last part. Let's just so how to make our democracies work. I really suggest this work by uh, Robert Putnam. Next, um, so his idea is that institutions shape policy. Institutions shape history. Let's just define institutions. Institutions are human uh, human designed, regularized practices for specific objective ends. Right. So, for instance, university is an institution that we made to raise awareness. Right. It's an institution. Right. Each institution has its own subculture, so on and so forth. So we have to be clear about the definition. The definition is that institution will shape. But the other thing is that institutions are also shaped by history. Kaya nga pinag-usapan ko parati sa Baguio, iba po yung ating kasaysayan. Because we were developed by Americans who were different kind of colonizers from the Spanish. The Americans were may, way more egalitarian. And the, the ethos that Americans brought to us in Baguio is different from what the Spanish brought to the rest of the country. That's why our institutional legacy is different. That's why we have different kind of institutions set up. That's why we're unique, as opposed to Imperial Manila. Um, but the other thing is that social context also matters. That's why civic culture matters. That's why us interacting matters. That's why us having dialogues matters. That is why us having trust in each other matters. The most successful societies on Earth are societies with high trust. Low trust societies are, tend to be the least successful one, with exceptions whereby you have a strong state to counteract that. For case in point, China. China is a low trust society. Have you noticed they're very family oriented? But because you have a strong state, they can organize their people to work in one way. Otherwise, China is, if you look at the history of China, it's either strong state or warlordism. They go extremes, right? Uh, and that's important to me because if you have read the work by, you know, uh, Harari, the book Sapiens? Okay. We are human beings, right? We're homo sapiens, I suppose, all of us, unless we're aliens here or something. His argument is this. He says, isn't it such a wonder and miracle that us human beings, look at us how weak we are, right? If you put a human being next to, a, I don't know, a, 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 any predator, we're no match. 
our, our muscular power is very limited. We're among the weakest, actually, animals on, on Earth. But the other thing is that we're actually also not the smartest. Monkeys, chimpanzees, have better short-term memory than us. I saw this video of, it's, they put Japanese kids who are supposed to be really smart and a chimpanzee baby. This was in Max Planck Institute. And then there is a screen there, na lalabas numbers. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. So the purpose is you memorize yung sequence. So they put the chimpanzee there, one, two, three, four, five. The chimpanzee goes like that, one, two, three, four. And then the Japanese kid could also do it. And then they speed it up. At some point, the kids couldn't do it anymore, but the chimpanzee perfectly knew which light came first, and then he perfectly traced it, which proved they have better short-term memory than us. If you put one human being and one chimpanzee in an island, you know who's going to survive faster. And yet, who has conquered this world and is destroying this world? Which brings us to environmental human beings. And our ability to be so powerful is because we can cooperate in large numbers than monkeys. Why? Monkeys can only cooperate to the maximum of around 150. Why? Because mathematically, you can only get to know 150 people intimately for you to have trust. In short, monkeys will not cooperate with you if they don't know you, then don't trust you. Human beings can cooperate in millions. Why? Because religion, because ideology, because nationalism, because we have abstract thinking, right? As Harari puts it very interestingly, he said, <laughs> if you told the chimpanzee, give me one banana, and then in heaven, I'll give you 10 bananas, <laughs> the chimpanzee will slap you and, and laugh at you. But human beings, a lot of them will believe you. Give me one banana, you'll get 10 in heaven. Yes, no problem. Get my bananas and my orange, right? So in a way, yung paka uto uto natin is actually helping us on an organized collective level. And the other thing with us, we also beat the ants because the ants can cooperate on large number. But what the ants don't have is flexibility. Have you ever seen ants committing coup d'etat against their queen bee? Did you have, do you see them committing revolution, right? Or having an impeachment trial against their queen bee or queen ant? No. Human beings do that. Pag nabuisi tayo, tinatanggal natin ng leaders natin, violently or otherwise. We are more flexible. It's our flexibility and ability to cooperate in large number that explains why we conquered this world. Unfortunately, we are also destroying it, right? But the same thing applies for nations. Nations that can cooperate on larger numbers, have higher level of trust, can actually have better cooperation and better impact and more successful. Lastly, I believe the solution to our problem is also to strengthen our state institutions. How do you do that? A strong state has at least two elements. It's autonomous and it's capable. Autonomous meaning hindi siya inapektuhan ng mga businessman, ng mga kumpare ni Pangulo, hindi mga taga boys of this city or boys of that city. It's a state that acts in the interest of the majority of society, of the national interest, not the minority that controls the state, right? And it should be capable. Ibig sabihin, may kakayahan siya na magbigay ng mga serbisyo. People think that strong state and strong man means pwede ka pumatay ng tao, meaning oppressive leader. Killing your citizens is an easy thing. Anyone can do that. Providing food, shelter, good employment to your citizens, that's the hard thing. And a good measurement of a strong state is provision of basic public services, roads, bridges. And the, one of the best indicators of strong state is also tax collection, if you can collect a lot of taxes. I'll give you a very quick number. This year, we have reached the highest tax collection ever in Philippine history, which kudos to this administration. We reached, uh, I think, the number 15%, right? We were almost exactly in the same ta number during Ramos period. That's why I believe Ramos was probably one of the best president, if not the best president we have had. Um, um, but what happened after Ramos was there was a populist president that who came in with his compare. He was eventually almost impeached and kicked out. Under that president, in only two years, our tax effort collapsed. And it took us 20 years, 20 years to fix that problem. So this is the problem. When you destroy institutions, it takes a long time to fix it, right? And you can see the implication of what I'm saying. So it took three presidents for us to fix our tax collection rate. Again, strengthen your institutions, right? And don't allow individuals to destroy them. Uh, next. OK, next. In short, there is hope. <laughs> that's, that's the whole argument I'm trying to make here. Don't believe that ang Pilipino ay ganito dahil kulturante ng ganito. That's not true. Our culture can change is malleable. We also need to have the right kind of policies. But you also have to have the right kind of leaders, right? And if you have right leaders, right policies, and an active citizens combined with empowered state institutions, you can have a successful country. The minimum, for instance, we can do in this country, if I'm going to give a proposal, is bawasan yung political appointees. We have thousands of positions of political appointees in this country that go to people even though they completely do not deserve it, right? 
Kahit alam nila, hindi nila deserve, they're still there. Kahit skandalo na skandalo, they're still there until they have to be kicked out, right? Sana yung mga of- officials, top officials, assistant secretary, USEC, they are actually selected based on pure merit. And these are people who work through bureaucracy. Because the bureaucracy is what will hold the country together. If we're familiar with Japan, you know that there are only two prime ministers you can remember in the last two decades, right? Kuizumi, Junichiro, and Shinzo Abe. Can you remember the other prime ministers they have had? You won't, because they change their prime minister every year almost. It's one of the messiest politics you can see. And by the way, they're parliamentary, right? But what holds Japan together is a very powerful bureaucracy and state. That's why when, when tragedies happen, like tsunami plus earthquake and everything back in 2011, you see how organized the Japanese people are. It was the police forces and the military and the bureaucracy that took care of the people. It had nothing to do with their political leadership. So if you have strong bureaucracy and strong state institutions, you're a resilient society, right? You're a robust society. And that's why we have to strengthen the bureaucracy and stop obsessing about electing a superman to save us from our own tragedies. Thank you very much. I warned you, it's going to be long. And <laughs> Who's, uh, we're going to have question and answer, right? Uh, could you moderate, please? Thank you. Uh, so the floor is now open for your questions or speaker. Yes, or a violent reaction, or no problem. Anyone who wants to start the ball rolling? Don't be shy. Uh, we don't bite. Yeah, it's all fine. Anyone or outside or inside? Maybe it's a, it's it's either a bad sign or a good sign, right? The bad sign is like that was a horrible presentation or that was so good. Like I have no disagreement with you, no comment, right? Alam niyo mga sarcastic comment like, di ba sa mga congressional hearing? Tapos may mga pabida, bibo, blah blah blah. And this is lang ng noted. Kaya lang sila, di ba? Pag Walang sense yung sinasabi nila. So, any question? Any, any, maybe we want to bring it back more home to Baguio, right? Because I gave you a very macro view, right? Essentially, I, com- I compressed 3,000 years of human history. Actually, even more kasi may Harari pa ako, no? 70,000 years of Homo sapiens into one hour and a half lecture, right? So, is there anything that you guys are interested in? Or you want a coffee break? Anyone? Okay, maybe I should start. Sure, let's go, let's go, yeah. Okay, uh, my first question is this. With regard to the how you ascribe causality, mm. so aside from weak correlation, of course, between democra- democratic de- uh, democracy and development, the other question is with regard to the direction of the causality or correlation, whether uh, the level of development may affect the kind of institutions that we have. Mm. My second question is with regard to how do you reconcile the role of a strong state with a well-flourishing market system, considering that if you have a well, well, you have a decentralized, uh, allo- an efficient decentralized allocation of resources, you won't be needing many of the functions of current strong states or strong governments. Sure. Okay, no other question? Because that was a complicated question. I know you were going to raise it as an economist. Um, First of all, I mean, for me, I, I don't buy this whole big state versus small state debate. I think it's a false debate. Um, look at the survey, for instance, of the world's most dynamic economies. You'll see countries like Denmark there, right, which have very high tax rates. And then you're also going to see countries with very low tax rates, right? Uh, Singapore, for instance, there. What it shows you that what's, it's not, so Samuel Huntington was really brilliant on this, right? He had horrible books like Clash of Civilizations. My God, never go through that. But his earlier books were good. His argument was this. It is not the type of government, but the degrees of government. In short, it is the efficiency, not the size that matters. Kind of might be misunderstood in different contexts, but you get what I'm saying, right? What matters is, it's not about how much regulation you have, but whether that regulation is efficient kind of regulation. Is it a kind of a regulation that actually allows for markets to flourish, to feel safe, right? So that's why if you look, to, you talk to investors, which I do, by the way. I talk to investors all the way. I don't make up these things. These are based on consultations with people on the ground or in palaces. Um, <laughs> um, not like Gaddafi tent palace, but uh, 
the thing is, they, they care about rule of law. And rule of law means predictability, means protection of private property, means also that your tax money is put into proper, nice infrastructure, you have high human capital. Those are the things that investors look like, look for, right? So whatever is the size of, size of the state. Also, the other question is how do you also measure the size of the state? There is also a methodological debate there. We don't have time to go through that. My point is I, I just don't want to go into that because I think it's a false debate. It's an ideological debate. The empirical debate shows you that what's important is whether you are a high-tax society, high-regulation society, or low-tax lawyer. If you do it efficiently, competently, you can have a flourishing economy. The second question is this. Do you, ha do you want to have a country... So U.S. has a very high per capita income, right, of $50,000. It's growing 3 to 4%. So you have a country like U.S., and then you have a country, let's say, like Germany, which is growing at 2 to 3%, right, with a lower uh, per capita income of around $40,000. But this is the difference. In one country, right, if you're not Ivy League graduate, if you're not from the top schools, right, you can still expect a more or less a dignified, decent job, right, right? In another country, if you're a Stanford graduate, you're going to have a plum job making millions of dollars. But if you don't have a college graduate, probably you won't even get the truck driver job because probably some, according to Trump, some Mexican got it from you, right? But actually, the re so the fact of the matter is that a country like U.S. Should, could be very highly dynamic, but there are a lot of people who would rather be unemployed in France than work in the U.S. because the unemployment benefits tend to be better in country A than in other countries. Now, I'm also against high welfare societies because too much welfare could be also taken advantage of. But evidence shows that in much more welfare society, much more regulated society than less regulated society, levels of income inequality are lower and the quality of democracy is also higher. So just compare democracy in Germany to democracy in the U.S., you can say by many measures Germany beats, beats the United States, right? And you'd rather be, if you're an average person, you'd rather be an average German than an average American. Because in America, if you're smart and well-educated and hardworking, sure, good. But not everyone is lucky to have your background and education and all of that. And in places like the U.S., if you don't have a job, it's very hard to get by. While in a lot of European countries, because they have a socialist system, you can have a decent life. Now, the problem, though, Europe is facing is immigration. So when many immigrants come in, they're not paying taxes and getting all that benefits, that's creating a lot of backlash, right? So there are also sustainability issues. But so for, I'm, I'm not going to answer your question by completely just dodging that question. On the issue of causality and correlation, whatever, it's a very jargonous debate. But what I can see is that if you look at all the leading works, at least from my, my understanding, is that directionality is not very clear. But there's a kind of a mutual reinforcement element there. As your political institutions become more mature, they tell to also be more helpful to your markets and vice versa if you have dynamic markets. So it's kind of like a yin and yang element, right? But there's a big debate about how you measure those, those basic elements. But for me, I mean, I, you know, for me, the, the countries you have to look for inspiration, they're, they're, we're not there yet, but there are things that you can copy from best practices. I think our, our, our Nordic societies and, and Germany, those kinds of countries, because they have a socialized market economy, and they're very efficient country. Where are the best cars made? They're made in Germany. In Germany, they have the uh, partnership uh, uh, in, in manufacturing system whereby government, employers, and laborers work hand in hand to make sure all of them are, are work for the country, right? So, sigurado mo hindi inabuso yung mga employees, at the same time, yung employers naman hindi naman masyado on due yung minimum wage on them. That kind of partnership scheme, I think, is something we have to work on. In the Philippines, we have the kind of a tri, kind of tri, trilateral also arrangements, but it's not done very efficiently, right? So what, what I'm saying in short is, I don't want to think about taxes, etc., tax rates. I want to look at tax effort. I want to look at how taxes are, are used, right? I want to look at how the state provides basic services and human capital. Once those things are done well, even if you have a lot of regulations, you can have a very entrepreneurial and successful societies. And if you're going to have growth, make sure it's a growth that trickles down to ordinary people, not just on gross level, right? So in that sense, I think those are the lessons that we have to keep in mind. It's a complicated question, but I'll keep it there, yeah. Yeah, I just have an observation on your talk and then a short question. The observation is, um, I thought it was brilliant. And I'm an American who's lived and worked in Asia for about 40 years. Mm -hmm. And the analogies that you gave of the countries over these last 30 years, I saw myself because I lived and worked in seven countries. So I really enjoyed that. My question is both in my home country, the US, mm -hmm. and my adopted country here in the Philippines, 
I can't quite understand with the current political trends how very, very normally rational people mm. are making very unrational choices mm. and justifications. And of course, that's a, another whole topic, but you know, you, you're, you wrote a book on Duterte, you're writing a book on Trump, there's a lot of analogy between the two. What, what would you say about this basic question about rational people right. making very unrational choices currently? Thank you. Right. Sure. Um, thank you very much for that question, assuming there's no other question for now. Um, as I said, I've probably been in Washington DC like six times over the past year, <laughs> trying to explain what's happening, right? And uh, I always tell uh, our friends, they're like, it feels home in DC. <laughs> and uh, in many ways, like I say, it seems the tree doesn't fall too far from the leaf, right? <laughs> we were a colony of America, but American politics are looking more and more like Philippine politics, right? So you, ha you see some sort of a historical reckoning happening there. No, um, I, said, I think Francis Fukuyama's wonderful latest books, not the earlier books, on this, explaining this issue. I mean, I think one big problem in the US is on the left, there's too much emphasis on identity politics. There's less emphasis on class politics. So there are a lot of Americans who feel ignored by the Democratic Party. That's why when Bernie Sanders came from out of nowhere, he just electrified it. Except they had to electrocute his candidacy to get Hillary Clinton in, and no wonder she lost, right? Um, and that's why Trump was able to come in, in the Ross Belt and all, right? So what I'm telling you is this. Actually, the dynamics of populism is different in the U.S. and the Philippines. U.S. populism won because a lot of Americans felt left behind by globalization. Of course, Republicans voted for Trump because they're Republicans. But the core, the Trump, Trump core are not Republicans, Republicans. It's really people in Rust Belt who are suffering from outsourcing. And people also, unfortunately, look at immigration as a possible problem, right? Whether it's high-skilled high high immigration or low-skilled. They see these colored people as a threat. And I feel for them, right? I, I don't agree with what they say, but I feel for them. Uh, in the Philippines, it's different. We are actually winners of globalization in the sense that we're growing crazy, right? We're not being left behind. We're just not getting enough trickle down, right? And immigration is a non-issue in the Philippines. We're the biggest exporter of human beings on earth probably next to Indians, right? And all these jokes about when you go around the world, you'd see two people, Indians and Filipinos, even in Eskimo probably. Um, so the factors that are driving populism in the developed world are different from factors driving here. There are similarities in the personality of people who are leading this, who are supposed to be outsiders. On the issue of rational and irrational, you know what? I, in a way, 2016 was an eye opening for me. So, of course, I broke down Duterte's election here, and I was in Times Square when Trump won. And people were literally crying. This is New York. <laughs> Not North New York, but you know, people were crying. People were getting drunk. It was like when I saw Florida going red, and I was like, it's over, my friend. This is stage of you. Trump is the one. Um, the fact of the matter is that I realized, I mean, I knew it all the time. And in social science, there's something called bounded rationality. I saw it, politics is about affective connection. The problem with a lot of people is they think that if you're smart and you explain things smartly, you can convince people. But if people cannot feel you, people cannot see your sincerity, right? They won't vote for you, even if you're the smartest guys. You're just another corporate executive looking out for yourself. Remember these jokes that are made about Hillary Clinton, like when there's a presidential debate, you see again, Trump is just like a mess, right? He goes around. Hillary Clinton, like if there's a question for her, she'll count seven steps and then she'll go like that and then angle 70 degrees because she does focus group discussion for everything, even for her hairstyle, the pacing. People know these tricks. People know that these are, there's a science of political manipulation. So they rather go with a self-confessed manipulator than with this um, you know, <laughs> than, you know, people who are uh, pretending not to be manipulators and actually they're manipulating. That's why in many ways it was a protest vote also in favor of authenticity, whatever you want to call it. So it was irrational, but in a way it was also a rational way of giving a wake-up call to what you want to call the political establishment, right? Um, and I think it applies also here in the Philippines. I mean, post-Marcos administrations had 30 years to do a lot of things, right? Now, I have one argument in favor of them. In, 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 in physics, there's a term called path dependency. So if, for instance, I mess up, the next person who comes after me has to first fix my, fix my mess, including $26 billion of debt, right? So there was a curse element, of course. But there were a lot of things that different administration could do. Like, for instance, land reform. Hacienda Luisita itself has not been land reform. And they had two presidents from coming out of that Hacienda. Isn't that the height of hypocrisy? 
Yes, they can give me an explanation. Hindi naman sila may ari talik. But come on. You cannot promise freedom, democracy, and good governance when you don't fix your own agenda, right? <laughs> Probably this is the new expression. There was so much hypocrisy, right, and self-righteousness and moral politics rather than effective governance that I think Filipino people, you know, honestly, honestly, the more I write about Duterte and write about the Philippines, I say I'm surprised that someone like Duterte didn't win earlier. Why did we wait 30 years, right? Probably if Duterte ran in the early time was someone like, you know, my point is this, it's not about Duterte. We would have voted for someone like that. We were just waiting for the right person to come because the grievance was building up for a very, very long time. So it's, so the most rational people make emotional decision when they're at the breaking point of frustration and desperation. It was a call for, it was a call for transformational politics. And my point is, I think that Duterte phenomenon is a corrective to hypocrisy of the previous administration, but is, is not a solution to the country's problems. I hope the next administration will dialectically right, have the best elements of both. I think what the liberals brought to the table was emphasis on human rights and human dignity, which I think is a great thing. But they forgot about socioeconomic justice. What Duterte brings on the table is greater emphasis in terms of socioeconomic justice, right? And effective bureaucracy. In fact, under Duterte, red tape is being reduced. I mean, there's a lot of corruption. Now. But, but the point is, if you look at Davao, for instance, they have one of the highest indicators in World Bank for good governance in terms of, like, 48 hours, you have a... So each of them have bring elements, but each of them also have a downside. The downside to this administration is that it seems they're too much underplaying the importance of human rights and political rights. So hopefully the next leadership will combine the best of elements of both and reject the hypocrisy of one and the kind of hot-headedness and unempiricalness of the other one. And, you know, that mouth all over the place one, right? So I'm optimistic there's still a forward. You know, my political formula is 20-60-20. Right? There are going to be 20% who will always hate you no matter what. There are going to be 20% who love you no matter what. Right? And then there are 60% who are up for grabs. Out of that 60%, if you get 31%, you have a majority already. You have a ruling coalition. That's my formula for governance. You're never going to get 100%, 90%. We live in an age where by social media and everything has divided us so much. All you need is to build a coalition. Right? So you're going to have 20% with you but you need another 31%. So I think that's why for me politics is the battle of one organized minority against another organized minority for the acquiescence of the majority. So I hope the next organized minority will really care and fight for the, the uh, acquiescent majority. If, if not, sana hindi na tayo silent majority. I'm sick and tired of hearing the silent majority. You know, instead of ranting on social media, go and go in the line, vote for heaven's sake, right? I hate voting in terms of it's so hard, but once you vote, once you register, it takes you two days to do it. Okay, magbayad ng 500 para mabilisan yan. You will have more stake. Once you pay taxes, you will have more stake, right? You have to have a strong sense of citizenship, but that comes once you vote, right? If you're not going to vote, if you're too lazy for that, no offense to people, your moral ascendancy is a little bit questionable. Of course, you have a right to rant. That's your, your freedom. But for me, first thing you have to do is vote. Make your voice heard, right? And we have a midterm elections next year. And midterm elections are important because they're a signal whether you're going in the right direction or not for the current administration, right? So let's send a very good signal in the next election. And the only election actually you have to care about for me in terms of national signal is Senate race. And so far, who are winning in the Senate? Independents. Neither the uh, hardcore DDS nor the liberals. It's the independents who are do doing well, which means people are looking for new alternatives. Yes. Dapat next Hello. time, I, my, I, my um, coffee sponsors tie and all while we're yes. doing this. I, <laughs> Sorry I, about that, sir. Yeah. I totally agree with you on your thesis about uh, strong institutions, Richard. Uh, Asemoglu is also uh, my, one of my favorite books. Um, but my question is, don't you think we need strong leaders to make institutions work? Mm. In other words, like the case of Singapore and Malaysia, you, you needed strong leaders to ensure that institutions work. It's not like sure. the institutions will, will become strong on their own, uh, especially for um, not so mature democracy, democracies sure. like ours. And at one point, uh, should we transition from a strong leader to a strong, to strong institutions? Sure. Okay, yeah. Again, the question is, what is the definition of strong, right? Does strong mean Unleashing your police for extrajudicial killings right and left, is that strong? Right? 
Uh, I'm not sure that was what Lee Kuan Yew was doing, right? Um, is strong, does it mean defying rule of law and imposing your own interpretation of the Constitution? Is that strong? So my problem is that our understanding of strong is like a padre de familia who beats his wife and kind of tells the children what to do, otherwise you'll get palo, right? We have a very wrong understanding of a strong leader. A strong leader is a visionary leader who is intelligent enough to know his limits. Lee Kuan Yew was a highly educated, highly articulate person. But the reason why Lee Kuan Yew was successful in the city of Singapore, let's be very clear about that, is because Singapore had a very effective bureaucracy. And that was a legacy of the British and also Confucian. And in Singapore, by the way, they have a zero tolerance policy. A single case of corruption, you're out. You're out. Of course, now it's a little bit different. But they had a very strong policy against corruption. And compensation is really high level. So secretary, cabinet members get CEO level incomes in Singapore, millions of dollars. The president earns millions of dollars, but they do a good job. So it's a meritocratic based and very highly intolerant of corruption. That's the story people are missing. They think Lee Kuan Yew just opened his mouth and the country became wonderful. That's not true. He worked with a state. So a strong leader is a leader that works with a strong team, and that team is your bureaucracy. That team is competent cabinet members you select, right? It's not one leader doing one. So I think one of our biggest, so of course you need a strong leader, but what do you mean by strong leader, right? It's a visionary leader. The other thing I said is, probably if Lee Kuan Yew was a leader in 21st century, probably he would not be as successful. Because the level of social media coverage and the level of, of, of scrutiny and checks and balance is not like in the old times. In the old times, it was much easier because power was better concentrated. Now, thanks to information technology and mobility, that's why I really suggest you read the work, End of Power. And it empirically shows you that power is so diffused that, for instance, parties that used to be in power for 20, 10 years now only stay in two years and then they circulate. Just the physics of power has changed. So even if Lee Kuan Yew was born today, fresh, young, 40, he was like a leader, I don't think he would be as successful because the nature of power has changed also. So two questions. One, we have to have a right understanding of strong leader. And two, we have to have a proper understanding of how power operates. But this is what I would say. One of the best observations I heard is, <laughs> Bakit mga Pilipino, they all, they're so dramatic. They always elect really dramatic presidents, right? Each of them would... You know, sometimes maybe what we need are three or four damn boring, competent presidents back to back to back. Probably that will do it for us, right? What we have is each president comes with this grand narrative and then destroys whatever good things the other one does. In for instance, there are some continuities like macroeconomic reforms. But sometimes we don't need two colorful leaders. We need colorful policies, right? And I think we're missing priorities here, right? By over-focusing on the personality of the leader, as I said, the leader should do the emotional thing, which is connect to the people. But he has to have a team of experts who actually do the thing competently. But the president, I'm not, no offense to someone, someone wants to run for the presidency soon, but the president has to have minimum competence too. Hindi na may big sabihin porque magaling kang ano, sa buhay, tumulong sa tao, you're entitled to be the president. You see, the problem is if your president doesn't have the minimum qualification, minimum, minimum basic understanding of public administration, economics, physics, you know, then when you become the president, who do you think really will call the shot? Your advisors, not the president. And that's unfair. I elect a president, but the advisor calls the shot. I don't like that. Because I'm not a physicist, but I'm, 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 I'm not idiot enough not to know what's the difference between, let's say, quantum mechanics and Newtonian physics. So if there are two physicists debating for, for me, I know the basic differences there of quantum mechanics versus things like that, or Einstein. Versus. So, you, so when a physicist number A and B debate in cabinet, I can kind of sense who is more sensible. But if I have zero competencies in physics and they have a debate about space program, how am I going to make a decision that who's more correct? I'll make a decision because, because mas friend ko siya, or his credentials are better. You know what I'm saying? Judgment is what presidents bring in. And you won't have judgment if you don't have minimum competence. And minimum competence in this world means you have to know a little bit about everything. Environment, politics, public administration, physics, science. So I really suggest look at this very interesting debate, uh, a video about Justin Trudeau when he discusses about uh, you know, basics in binary system. Versus, <laughs> and then there's a picture of another president, you know, who can barely express himself about plutonium, right? You have to know some basic science and basic arithmetic and basic things. And what really bothers me is not irrational votes once in a while, it's celebration of ignorance, 
Like, ay, ma- mausay kami, hindi kami eksperto eh. Puso galing eh, purong puso eh. Tuloy, tingnan mo yung gilas. <laughs> hindi pwede po yung puso lang, dapat may utak rin. I-combine mo yan, right? So I hope our next presidents are both a combination of brains and and heart. Because because this is it. They always say, pag-edukado, nagiging corrupt rin naman. But the fact of the matter is that if you're educated, at least there's a chance you'll do good policies. But you also have to have a good heart. So it's what you call, what you say, necessary but not sufficient. It's necessary to be well-educated, but you also have the heart to be sufficient. But if you don't even have minimum qualification, you don't even have the basic necessities, I'm going to be worried about where this country is going, right? So hopefully in the next elections, we vote for someone who has political will, which is very important, but also the smart direction. Because what's, political will is like a cannon. If you don't have the right mind, you will bomb your neighbor, right? Instead of bombing your enemy, right? So you have to have the right direction, and for that you need cognitive competence. Okay, before I collapse, uh, let me thank you guys so much. I know that was really drawn out. Uh, and looking forward to coming back again soon. Thank you very much. Pleasure. Jeez, that was uh, to express our appreciation, may call on Dr. Alejandro Sienza on behalf of the Dean to present our token for our speaker. Thank you very much. So if you need a copy of the PowerPoint presentation with our speaker's permission, you can obtain it from me or from the department. Thank you. (laughs) Thank you very much. And that concludes our activity. Thank you very much, Professor.